Well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, thank you to the Arizona um, Archaeological and Historical Society for inviting me uh, and everybody you know, for attending virtually um, and physically. Um, so, but the title is Achitas, uh, A History of Looting and Ceramic Fakes in Northwest Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, so this lecture will focus on the town of Matortiz and explore the relationship between its modern inhabitants and the prehistoric sites and goods associated with the site of Paquime. Matortiz is located less than 100 miles south of the U.S.-Mexico border in the state of Chihuahua, Mexico. Near the foothills of the Sierra Madre Occidental and west of the Palanganas River, a tributary to the Casas Grandes River. The map shows its location to, in relation to Nuevo Casas Grandes. Um, and the site of Paqui Mayor or, Cas or Casas Grandes Viejo. Um, and I will be talking about uh, the town of Gomez Farias as well in a little bit. Um, so here's a photograph of Matortiz and the site of Paqui Mayor. Have any of you been to either of them? Yay, great. <laughs> so I don't have to go into too much detail. I'm just kidding. Um, so the site of Paqui Mayor is characterized by Puebloan style architecture. 2,000 room blocks and Mesoamerican style platform mounds and uh, ball courts. Uh, Pagamet was abandoned prior to European contact. So the modern inhabitants of the region are not, there's a lot of evidence that they're direct descendants of, of the prehistoric inhabitants of Pagamet, so. So I'm gonna give a really brief history of the town of Matortiz. Uh, prior to the Mexican Revolution, the state of Chihuahua was not heavily populated. Uh, most of the state was divided into large haciendas, most of which were foreign owned. Um, the Pearson Lumber Company, or Estacion Pearson, was established in 1909 by Frederick Stark Pearson. The sawmill produced about 3 million feet of timber per month um, that was shipped to El Paso without trimming or edging. The town boasted with a ho hospital, a hotel, and a movie theater. Um, the several factors that led to the decline of Pearson was the Mexican Revolution, uh, the low demand for lumber due to World War I, um, and the untimely death of Pearson in 1915. So everything was dismantled and um, very few structures remain in the town nowadays. So after the Mexican Revolution, there was an influx of population in the state of Chihuahua. Land was divided into ejidos or communal land um, Matortiz was established as an ejido under the municipality of Casas Grandes under the name Juan Matortiz was given um, in honor of the ca captain who fought to murder Apaches in the region. Uh, the local economy was based on small scale agriculture and seasonal jobs associated with the railroad. However, the relocation of the repair yard to, to Nuevo Casas Grandes in the 60s highly impacted the economy of Matortiz. Mexican agricultural policy shifted in favor of large-scale commercial landholders or industrial farming. And ejidatarios suffered unequal access to loans and new technologies and simply could not compete with the industrial capitalists of the time. So the, in the early 1970s, the pottery movement emerged, which invo involved the revival of Paquime style pottery pottery designs in the town of Matortiz, Chihuahua, Mexico. This movement was led by the potter Juan Quesada as a sole innovator and his patron, Spencer McCollum. Um, I'm gonna just briefly go, I'm sure most of you have heard the story of, of Juan Quesada and Matortiz, but, um, but it basically goes that uh, the, this man by the name of Spencer McCollum was in the town of Deming in a little like antique shop and he bought these three pots that were being sold as prehistoric pots, but he knew enough about pottery to know that they were fakes or they were replicas, but they were really well made. So he decided to buy them and went on a quest to find who this artist was who made this, these pots because because they were so well made. So uh, story goes, he you know went to Palomas and Janos, Asuncion, and eventually ended up in Matortiz and met this man named Juan Quesada. Um, and according to both, um, Juan Quesada was entirely self-taught 
and he was simply inspired by the pottery shirts he found on the ground. Um, and Spencer started providing a monthly stipend for Juan to work on his craft um, and devote all his time to um, his craft. And he became really good. So he started teaching some of his siblings um, and Spencer started taking him to universities and museums across the United States and he became very popular and there was a demand for these pots. And um, so little by little, he started teaching more family members and then it just became a community of, of potters basically. So this origin story told by both Spencer and Juan and retold by many others is one filled with inspiration and chance encounters. However, this story fails to acknowledge how looting and the creation of ceramic replicas contributed to the development of this pottery movement. So the purpose of this lecture is to examine that history, the history of looting, the emergence of ceramic fakes, and establish their defining characteristics. Data for this project was collected through extensive interviews with 16 looters, 20 potters, um, three collectors or buyers, and several museum professionals. Ancillary to the interviews, a ceramic replication was conducted by elder potters Macario Ortiz and Reynaldo Quesada to better understand the process of making hechizas or ceramic fakes. And the word hechiza is derived from the verb hacer or to make. Um, so hechizas translates to handmade in the context of Mato Ortiz. So when I started doing the interviews, I, I kept on hearing the word hechiza and it could also translate to something that's spellbound which to me made sense because if they're trying to fool people, you know, it's, so I, I immediately was like, oh, so this, because you were trying to fool people, is that why you're calling them hechizas? And they were like, no, 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 it's just because they're handmade. So within the context of Matortis, that's what hechizas means. So I wanna back up a little bit and talk about how I got involved with this project in the first place. So um, the late Dr. Jelly, Jane Kelly and I had overlapping interest in the region. And she reached out to me one day and asked if I was interested in pursuing like a small project with her. Um, and it was all based on her experience with what she calls the Robles pot. And she was, work, it was, in, she was working in the Rancho Robles in Gomez Farias um, in 1991 uh, for the Proyecto Arqueológico Chihuahua PAC. And the owner of the ranch, Hilfrido Robles, showed Dr. Kelly three pots he claimed to have found in a burial. And Dr. Kelly photographed the pots. Um, and he even showed her where he found the, the, the pots and where he had you know, excavated them from. And, um, and she photographed them throughout the years and eventually she took them to Ina Chihuahua. So then the authenticity of the pots came into question in 2012 when she was visiting, she was visiting Casas Grandes and he, she visited with Spencer McCollum and she was showing him photographs of her excavation and the recent finds. And, and they came across this picture of the three pots. So Spencer was like, wait, 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 let me, can I look at those pots right away or that picture? And so she stopped and she was like, he was like, well, Juan made those. And she was like, no, 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 these were, these were looted from a site that I was working at and the, the rancher showed me where they took them. And, and he was like, no, I'm pretty sure that looks like Juan's early work. So of course, Jane was a little confused and they took the photographs to Juan and he identified two of the three as being made by him. So, um, so yeah, um, Dr. Kelly approached me and she was like, would you be interested in maybe doing some interviews and trying to flesh out when they started making these replicas or what are the defining characteristics, characteristics? How can we as archeologists that work in Chihuahua or even museum professionals that work with Casas Grandes pottery, how can we identify ceramic fakes? Um, and I originally thought I was just gonna go and interview the Quesadas and maybe Spencer and, you know, and that was it. Um, but it turned into much more than that. So to better understand the emergence of replicas, we must first examine their origins, which was looting. So this is a brief overview of the data collected through interviews with early looters in the region. And of course, I'm never gonna use their names or anything. They were very gracious to let me <laughs> record their interviews and everything. So 
Um, so subsistence looting began in the early 60s, and it was greatly influenced by the joint Casas Grandes project at the end of the and the end of the railroad industry in the area. Now looting was happening in the area prior to that, but this is what I call subsistence looting, where people were literally putting food on the table with the things they were selling and finding. So um, sites were identified near plowed fields or visible mounds. There was a demand for complete decorated pots or what they called pintas. Um, and you usually would take all the artifacts, they would not discriminate any artifact type because they knew they were gonna, they would sell whatever they would find. Um, of course, this varied by region within the, the Matortis area, they, they were taking everything. But when I interviewed looters in other parts of Chihuahua, up in the Sierras, they were mostly just taking the decorated um, pots that they knew they were gonna sell for sure. Um, skeletal remains were usually uh, reburied after all the associated objects were removed. This was a, usually a, a group activity of up to 20 individuals, mostly men or, and family and friends. Um, they spent one to 15 days at a particular site. Um, activities such as eating, drinking, and smoking were associated with looting. Um, and looters sold antiquities by the truck bed load initially. So they were selling a lot. Um, a well-known collector who I had a really hard time tracking down and he really didn't wanna be interviewed by me, but eventually he did. And uh, he admitted to selling up to 10,000 pots from the Casas Grandes region and to have a, a album full of photographs that he would send to collectors in the US. So, yeah. Okay. So after interviewing several uh, looters and potters in the region, it became evident that all early potters had previously been looters and participants in the antiquities market. All early potters, except for Juan Quesada, admitted to such activities, although Juan's own family members placed them in the trenches along with them. All early potters admitted that during the mid to late 60s, they began having a hard time finding sites and objects to sell. So they had essentially exhausted the archeological record Hello. Or at least the one near Mato Ortiz. Hello. So a group of former looters began experimenting with pottery making and creating what they called hechizas or replicas. This group, this group was composed of Felix Ortiz, Manuel Olivas, Emeterio Ortiz, Salvador Ortiz, Rogelio Silveira, and Juan Quesada. Their goal was to make either exact copies of the prehistoric pots or similar forms and designs or a pastiche and ultimately make them appear prehistoric to sell them to existing customers. Um, it is important to mention that the early potters were strictly replicating Jamos polychrome, no other Chihuahuan type. So the replication was conducted by Macario Ortiz, which was um, Macario Ortiz and Rinaldo Quesada, which was uh, Juan's brother. Um, over the course of five days, uh, the process was, doc was documented through photographs, video, voice recording, and personal notes. Both potters had made and sold the cheeses for a living in the, in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, so I asked them to use the same play sources they used back then and, and employed the same methods. And um, because I forgot to mention once, once Spencer showed up and was uh, providing a stipend for Juan and, and giving attention to his pottery, people stopped making the replicas right there and then, and they started all creating their own pottery styles. And it, you know, it just grew to what it is today. And um, they all have their own styles. They're all have, you know, so they're, they're not, they stopped using some of the clay sources they used back then. They refined their methods and everything. So I asked them to stay, take a step back and, and just remember what sources they were using back then and what methods. And um, so they were gracious enough to do that. And I just, I think they're just, they're such characters. I love their faces. Um, so the clay source was located one mile west of town near the heavily looted foothills near Matortiz. A total of five pounds of clay were collected 1.5 meters from the ground surface. Uh, the clay was processed, uh, it was first ground with a mano and a metate. Yes, it was a prehistoric mano and a metate they were using uh, and into a fine dust, then filtered through a screen. Then it was mixed with water, a two to one ratio, 
until a dough-like consistency was achieved and it was no longer sticky. It was then kneaded and pounded to remove any air pockets. Then it was formed into a ball and placed into a plastic bag and put rest for 24 hours. Um, vessel formation. So both potters used a, a plaster of Paris mold to form the base of the pot and employed a variation of pinching, coiling, and scraping to create the body of the vessel. Reynaldo fashioned a vintage automobile water pump into a potter's wheel, as you can see. Uh, tools used during this process were a hacksaw blade, an old spoon, a children's play plate, a large screw, and a sponge. Uh, painting or vessel decoration. Uh, both vessels were painted or decorated during the wet stage, not the traditional leather hard stage that most Pueblo potters use. After Reynaldo formed his piece, he let it sit for an hour, then began to decorate the edge and interior of the bowl with a screw and a hacksaw blade to create a punk tape pattern. Now I know this, they probably wouldn't have done this with the achisas back then, but I think they both just kind of did what they were also more comfortable with. So I, I didn't question it. Um, Macario was having um, issues with his eyes, so we had to ask the neighbor and fellow potter Gloria Hernandez to paint the vessel. She used locally sourced mineral paints and human hairbrushes. She painted the designs that Macario chose and that he would have, he would have used back then. Um, so most chichisas are made, were made with a darker clay that was later slipped to look like a Ramos polychrome. Um, early potters talked about having an issue finding the, the creamy white clay that was used to make the, the prehistoric Ramos polychrome. And the few sources they found of this clay, um, it was really hard for them to work with it and they just could never make it, you know, do what they wanted it. So, so they ended up just using a slip over the, the darker clay. Um, so due to time constraints, we only did a band of the slip uh, along the middle of the vessel. So after the vessel was painted and decorated and dried for three hours, uh, they covered it in baby oil and slightly polished it with a stone or a metal rod. And then they let dry for 24 hours before firing. So the firing process, uh, the, the potters constructed a metal cage to protect the vessel during firing. Uh, they first started three small fires with cottonwood surrounding the vessel to gradually increase the temperature and have an even distribution of heat for 20 to 30 minutes. They eventually stocked larger pieces of wood around the metal basket and wrapped everything with wire and fired for another 20 minutes. Then they removed the, the burn bark after that. Um, so right after the vessel was fired, um, sugar was sprinkled on the surface of the vessel to create uh, what they called what they thought were use wear stains or uh, for some reason, they had this belief that the use wear stains that the prehistoric pottery had were, um, were blood. So there was a lot of experimentation with blood for some reason, uh, with human blood and with animal blood. Um, so they, they, after they realized that blood was not leaving the, the use wear stains or the spots they, were, they wanted, they started experimenting with various things and throwing them at the pot. And, so they found that sprinkling sugar on the surface would create this kind of stain or, you know, on the surface. So, so they would sprinkle the, sh the sugar or put like a handful of sugar on top um, and it would create this like stain. And, um, other, other techniques include, uh, they would rub the vessel with rocks or beat the, or beat the vessel. Uh, they would rub it with, with mud, with blood, ashes, uh, charcoal, dry pecan tree leaves. Uh, they would also boil some water with pecan tree leaves and then dip the vessel in it uh, because they say it would create like a patina effect on the vessel. Um, and then, so after both vessels were cooled down after firing, they, were, they dipped them in muddy water and rubbed, rubbed them with dirt. Um, after that, uh, they were buried, making sure there was enough dirt inside each vessel uh, to prevent from any breakage happening or because of the weight of the soil. So this is what I call uh, planting replicas. Uh, so burying the pots or artifacts to age them is a well-known practice all over the world. Uh, what is not common is burying pots in previously looted sites. 
like they did in the Matorfis region or the Casas Grandes region. So, um, like I said before, they they had existing clients that that they would you know sell pottery or prehistoric pottery to. So um, when they started making these replicas, um, they would take the replicas, age them, and everything, and then take them to sites that they had previously looted um, and bury the pots in those sites. Um, and then when the buyers would show up, they would tell them, all right, we're going to go out, we're going to, you know, take you out there and you don't have to pay me if we don't find anything. So, <laughs> um, so burying the replicas was not only an antiquing technique, but also a foolproof way of reinforcing authenticity, uh, the ultimate antiquing method. So how are you going to question something that <laughs> if there's being uncovered right in front of your eyes? So. Um, we need to consider that some of the replicas might still remain in previously looted sites. Um, and then we also need to consider this as part of a site formation process. You know, if, if things are being reinterred, not only was the looting, did the looting happen or the destruction, but then something else was interred. And then, you know, so it's, it, it brings all these things into question. And, um, and this practice, practice might explain uh, Dr. Kelly's experience with the Robles pots. You know, it, it's unclear whether, uh, you know, Gilfrido, the owner of the ranch, actually was telling the truth or, or he was unaware and somebody else buried them and was trying to sell them and age them or whatever. But um, so that might explain what was happening with that case. So um, after two weeks, I returned to Matortiz to uncover the hechizas. Um, and it was actually a really interesting <laughs> activity with, with both of these guys because they were, they were actually really excited to uncover them. And I'm like, we know they're there. Like, <laughs> but they were like pretending like, like they're old days, I guess. And they were like, oh, I wonder what we're going to find. And there was just like all this banter in between them. And I was like, oh, okay. But um, yeah, it was really interesting. Um, so here's a, the finish or the finished product. I, um, right after they were, they, we unburied them. Um, so I know these don't look exactly prehistoric and they were, they're not gonna fool a lot of people. Um, and really the replication was done to understand the process that they you know, employed back then. Um, so thanks to my very uh, playful cat, uh, we have now itchy such shirts. <laughs> um, so the, the pot went full circle. And just like prehistoric pots, now we have itchy such shirts. So there you go. So the characteristics of itchy such. Um, so first, replicas were not polished or smooth from the inside of the vessel. And I mean, you have to understand prehistoric pots were being made to be used, to be used for cooking, for storage, for um, transportation. And replicas are only being made for aesthetic purposes. So usually that's the first sign. Um, the inside will be really rough and bumpy. It's not gonna be polished. It's not gonna be you know, refined or anything. And then you know, in prehistoric pots, you're also gonna find um, evidence of you know, where things were cooking or you know, some form of attrition or uh, use wear, and, but they were definitely not smoothed or polished on the inside. Um, replicas usually have a visible line or ridge uh, from where they were using the plaster of Paris mold. So um, you'll, you'll <laughs> Paul actually had an Echisa in his house and we were gonna bring it so you could actually see it and you could actually feel the, the ridge where, where the, the, the mold was. But anyway, if you, if you go to, you know, they have one at a museum or something, then you'll know, you'll know the. Um, replicas were made, as I said earlier, with a darker clay that was slipped to look lighter. Um, they were also made with naturally uh, occurring, naturally tempered clays with very large inclusions versus the fine sand tempered clay used for Ramos polychrome. Replicas were painted during the wet stage, not the traditional leather hard stage, and were rarely burnished and or polished before the paint was applied. 
Uh, Ramos polychromes usually follow a continuous design throughout the vessel, while most of the replicas were fragmented into panels. Um, and then we usually have two styles that they, they were either copying an exact Ramos vessel or they were doing a pastiche of different, you know, um, designs. So here's a, the visible line. This actually looks exactly like your, your pot ball. So you can see the line right here. Um, and this is a, the plaster of Paris mold that I was talking about. Um, and it's, I mean, you can visually see it, but also feel it. Um, and then the other thing is the, the, these potters were not, since a lot of times they would leave the pot in the, in the mold while they started painting it. Um, so you will rarely see any design below that line or in the, in the base of the pot um, when it comes to replicas. So here's a Echisa, you can see some of that line here. Here's another very visible line, and then we have the bowl. But I mean, you look at the bottom of this bowl, I mean, that would fool me <laughs> that it was a, a prehistoric pot. And here's an example of Ramos polychrome and how you see there's the design goes beyond the base of the of the vessel down here as well. You, you're not seeing any visible ridge or line because they were mostly just doing the coil and pinching. Um, so clay slip and temper, like I said earlier, um, the echisas were made with like this this uh, naturally tempered clay, so that we have these really large exclusions. It almost reminds me of like a lot of the pottery that's made in the Jornada Mogollon or the El Paso area. Cause it's like this, I, I call it like this popcorn temper and it's very obvious. And, and so the replicas are made with, with clay like this with these really large exclusions um, that you can see. And then you can see that the inside is very rough looking. It's darker. You can see where the slip was, was applied. And here are more examples of Echisa. So I, there's actually uh, a young potter in Matortiz that started buying back a lot of Echisas from collectors. So he has like a pretty decent <laughs> collection of Echisas and he was a great source for this. Um, so it's the same thing. You see, you know, that they've been slipped. They're darker on the inside. Right here, you could see the difference in color. Um, again, the face is not, well, you can't see it. But yeah, there's a lack of interior burnishing and the use of slip. And, um, and here's an example of a Ramos polychrome. I kind of like I was saying they were made with this, this much creamy, lighter clay that was this really fine um, sand temper. Um, and I mean, a lot of people argue that, pol that Ramos polychrome is not really a polychrome because um, technically the, the clay is the, the creamy color. So uh, but anyway, that's not, that's not for this lecture. <laughs> Here's a, a comparison. Um, so like I said, since they were painted during the wet stage versus, versus the traditional leather hard stage, um, usually when, when that happens, the clay absorbs the mineral paint a lot more. And since they were not, being, they were not polishing them or burnishing them, it has like a, like a, a lack of luster or sheen, as you can see. And, um, like the Ramos polychrome just looks so much shinier and better. And not all the time. I mean, they did burnish some of them, um, but this was a very obvious, like the paint just looks so different. Um, and here are just some examples of some of the use wear stains that, that were <laughs> employed on replicas. Again, they're not, I think they use the sugar here or something else or ink or something. Cause it's, um, this one looks a little more believable, I guess, but. Yeah, and you see the, the darker inside, the darker clay. Um, just another example of a Ramos polychrome. Again, the, the lighter clay, you know, the design beyond the base, there's no ridge. Um, some of the wear signs are, you know, look more natural, not like these, you know, evident 
um, sugar stains or whatever. Um, so another thing to consider is the tools that were being employed. Um, so the modern tools are gonna leave imprints that uh, will not be present in prehistoric pots. So such as like the metal screw and the bolt that was used, a hacksaw blade, um, a sponge or the, the plastic children's plate that was used. So we need to consider that as well. So again, going back to the Robles pots um, and Dr. Kelly's experience, here's a, an example of a Juan Quesada effigy that was made in the 70s and it's almost identical to this one, except for the head. Um, but of course, um, I mean, we're, I interviewed so many community, community members and um, you know, there's multiple narratives as, as you know, should be expected. Um, so there's, there's even question whether these were actually made by Juan or were they made by, by a different potter. And so I'm not gonna get into the details of that, but you know, it's good to, a lot of the focus in Matortis for many years has just been focused on, on Juan Quesada and Spencer McCollum. And I think it's important to acknowledge that this is a community of potters. It's not just one man. So it's good to hear other people's perspectives, other people's stories, um, and not just take one person's perspective for, you know, as the absolute truth. And again, um, Dr. Kelly did go back to talk to Gilfrido Robles, the owner of the ranch, and was like, hey, these were identified by Juan Quesada, like, you know, what's going on? And he's, he stuck to a story that, they were prehistoric and they, they had been looted from his ranch. So we're, we'll just never know. So um, the, the data collected through these interviews and the replication process demonstrate that this is a complex, complex subject that deserves further analysis. Subsistence looting was a reaction towards a dwindling Mexican economy for small landowners in the region, and the creation of rep replicas represents an integral part in the development of this pottery movement, one that has been omitted from the written narrative. The early replicas have clearly blurred the lines between historic and prehistoric pottery styles, as is the case with the Robles pots. Replicas are modern artifacts embedded with meaning and are the ultimate product of creativity, resourcefulness, and resilience. The Spencer Quesada narrative is highly romanticized and places the development of pottery, of a, part of a pottery movement on a single individual. It's the perfect hero's journey, filled with tribulation and triumph, but one that ultimately silenced the voices and collective experiences of a group of individuals. It is evident from the interviews that the Martortis art movement was one that emerged from poverty, looting, not from a single man's inspiration, but rather from a collective effort to maintain a, a declining antiquities market and to garner, garner basic economic resources. And I believe the data collected through these interviews and the replication process could aid archeologists conducting field work in the region and museum professionals who work with Casas Grandes ceramic collections. Oh, and these, these are just portraits of a lot of the elder potters that I interviewed and some of the participants of the antiquities market and. They were all very gracious with me. Some of them have passed away already. So I'm really glad that I got to document their stories and that they got to share their stories with me and their homes and they were so welcoming. And um, so I feel very fortunate to, to have met a lot of these people and have been able to interview them. So um, do we have any questions? We'll take, we'll take questions first. From the in-person audience, are there any questions? No, okay, hold on. Hi there, um, I guess I'm just curious, um, obviously Ramos Polychrome is kind of known archeologically as like a very standardized ceramic type. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, if, if these kind of, uh, attempts to mimic Ramos polychrome started in the late 50s, early 60s, right around the, the, the kind of the joint Casas Grandes project. Like how much do you think 
the degree of standardization that we as archaeologists think is the case in Ramos polychrome might actually be impacted by kind of the movement of, of kind of these knockoffs um, that, you know, were, were meant to kind of mimic that style. Do you think there is some sort of, you know, false, false connection there with, with the degree of standardization or? I think there is. I mean, I think there's a lot more variation that we, we really think even within Ramos polychrome. Um, I think it was, it was just what was more readily available or what they would find more often than not. Um, and that's why they decided to replicate that. Um, but I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, people that are doing more research on Ramos polychrome, I mean, there's definitely more variation than we really think uh, for sure. So. Okay. Aside from the skills involved in, in doing these replicas, are there any legal issues in Mexico associated with this work either in the 70s or now? Um, well, yeah, I mean, looting is an illegal activity. So, um, or are you meaning? In no, I mean, uh, trying to sell replicas as originals. Um, that I know of, nobody ever got arrested for that. They were, they got arrested for looting, but I'm not really sure that, I'm sure there is some a reprimand at least, but legally, I don't think there was a, repercussion in that sense. I think it was more the, the destruction of sites. But the other thing is the vast majority of these went up to the United States. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, they were just passing through to the United States and I'm not sure anybody cared in the United States. Any other questions in here? I just wanna uh, say to the folks that are here virtually, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box if you have some, uh, and we'll keep taking questions from here, thanks. My question is, um, do you think that the market for the fakes themselves helped actually protect maybe some of the prehistoric ceramics that were still in neighboring areas? Oh, for sure. I'm kind of glad they stopped and they actually started experimenting because they left something for Paul and Mike to excavate. Not much. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think that happened. Anybody else have some questions? Yeah. <clears throat> So the people that you interviewed who made the replicas and who originally made the fakes, um, did it work the way they might have hoped? And did they become more economically successful over time? Uh, by selling replicas? Yeah, and by selling the fakes originally, I suppose. Oh, well, it's the same thing. Um, yeah. I okay. think they were, the replicas just were able to maintain what, what they were making selling the prehistoric pots, but the real change came really with Juan and, and Spencer and the fact that they brought attention to the community and you know they realized like, oh, we can make these and they don't have to be replicas. They don't have to, you know, we don't have to be trying to make them look prehistoric. We could just make artwork and sell it because people are interested in buying it. So I think that was a real, you know, mark or change, and it really brought economic success to the to the um, community. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to discredit Spencer or Juan's um, contributions, you know, to Matortiz because it's it's real, it's true, and there's real talent there. It's just, is it the entire story or is it the full picture? Um, and they definitely brought attention to the town. They brought an industry to the town. So, any other questions? Well, I have one quick question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I didn't quite get, you showed a photo of them dipping the uh, fired replica pot into some kind of um, tea made of leaves. And yeah, they, they boiled pecan tree leaves. What, what kind of leaves? Uh, pecan tree oh, or pecan. Good yeah. Lord. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and would they put the pots in while they were still hot or no? They were already cooled off. They were. Yeah, cooled. they were cooled off. Okay. Yeah, but it's supposed to create some sort of patina to the surface. Yeah. Okay, we'll go to questions from the virtual audience. Okay, um, we know John made uh, Juan made many fa fake uh, Casa Grande pots. Did you find any evidence that he ever misrepresented this work with the buyer? Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but 
the thing is, um, how do I say this? Juan, Juan is very, in, in the interview with Juan, he, he's very controlled with his words. You know, he never admits to looting. He never admits to any of that. He, he talks of himself as an artist that was inspired by the designs and the pottery shirts. So he won't even admit to making replicas. So it's, it's you know, and that's his story and I'm not gonna argue with it. So that's all I have. Okay, how many potters are making pots today? How many were making them a decade ago? Has that changed? I believe right now the town is 500 artists, 500 potters. Um, so I'm assuming, you know, these are new generations. And so there were less, a little less before then, but I know for, for sure right now it's about 500 potters in the community. But would you please go over the various things done to pots to make them look old? I think you did, but is there anything else you wanna add? Um, like, like I said, there was a, they did experiment a lot with bodily fluids. Um, so a lot of blood and uh, animal blood and um, maybe pee. <laughs> uh, they were just really trying all kinds of stuff to, to try to get them to look old. Uh, but yeah, definitely, you know, rubbing it with rocks, rubbing, you know, beating it, um, using leaves, using bark, any kind of, you know, anything that would create abrasions on the surface or, um, I know they, they tried a few concoctions of boiling different things uh, other than just the, the pecan tree leaves, but I guess that seemed to work the best. Um, let's see, were there other people besides Spencer who helped the Mata Ortiz potters? Um, I think eventually um, there were a lot of buyers and people that got involved in the community that have helped tremendously. Um, so, but initially it was mostly Spencer that really brought attention to, that I know of, uh, to the region, but there's been, you know, many buyers and people involved and that, that have helped out the potters. Are there other questions from the audience? I still have more from online, but anything here? I wanted to go back and forth if we need to. Okay, how about, um, as far as you know, have any other areas or regions picked up this industry as a mon money-making industry? Um, not that I know of, that, that was a question I asked a lot of the potters at, at the end of the interviews. And I, I would ask them like, why do you think this happened in Matortiz? Like what's so unique about this town? You know, there was poverty in other towns of Casas Grande or, or in, the, in the region. You know, there was, there was a need, there was, there's creative people everywhere. So why did it happen in Matortiz? And they all gave me different answers, but I think the most common answer and the one that made the most sense to me was because we have all the clay sources nearby. And, you know, so that makes sense to me. And they just were resourceful and yeah, I think that's a, that's a good answer. All right, are Mata Ortiz pots still selling well these days? Um, relatively, I think there, a lot of the younger generations have really educated themselves and, and uh, pushed themselves and kind of marketed their work in really creative ways. You know, I, I know some of them have started doing textiles or other forms of, you know, other ways to use the Pakimet designs. So I feel like definitely the, the younger generation is really doing well in that sense. I mean, I, I, I became friends with a lot of them. So I see them, you know, coming to Santa Fe or to different parts of the US and getting shows and getting, you know, having sales or, or whatever. So I feel I, that's left a, an older generation a little bit behind because you know, they haven't, they don't speak English, they don't, they don't do social media very well. And that's definitely kept them from, um, you know, selling their pots to a larger audience. So I think right now they're definitely the younger generation is still pretty successful in my opinion, but there isn't the demand that there was for, for Matortis pottery that, you know, there were 20, 30 years ago. The, the thing about that is that, um, the demand and the, and the popularity of Matortis pottery brought a lot of money very quickly to the town. So with that, it also brought 
a lot of other problems, you know, with addiction or there was excess of something. So, um, so there was, there was that as well. All right. This is from Jeremy Cunningham. He says, hi, Fabiola. Uh, fantastic talk. Given how much of our understanding of Casas Grandes ideology currently depends on Ramos iconography from museum collections, do you think Echezas uh, from those collections might be skewing our interpretations? Uh, definitely. I mean, I, I've seen Echezas in several museums by now that, yeah, definitely. It's, it's, and it's something that we need to consider when we're doing this type of research um, that focuses on ceramic analysis, that some of these, I mean, some of these wouldn't fool some of us, but some of them are really well made. So we def definitely need to be cognizant of, of the Chisas. All right, are there efforts to replicate the manganese splotches on ancient Casas Grandes pottery? Can you repeat that? Um, are there efforts to replicate the manganese splotches? Um, not that I know of. Okay, and uh, this person says, I'm a physics professor from UTEP and have studied pottery pieces from New Mexico. Would like to, oh, sorry, that's, I don't need to read that one. I'll get that to you. Um, I'll go ahead and type that to you. Um, what are the, what was the attitude of the potters that you interviewed regarding the fact that so much credit has gone to Juan and Spencer and not to other potters who were involved in the early movement? Oh. Getting some hard questions. <laughs> Um, well, when I first started the interviews, a lot of the potters immediately would credit Juan and would be like, oh, yeah, Juan taught me, Juan this, Juan that. And then once they got a little more comfortable and they, they knew, you know, one, I'm Mexican, I speak Spanish, my family's from the region, um, they definitely started opening up a little more to me. And then maybe by my second visit, they were like, you know, Juan didn't teach me. It was my uncle Felix or it was so and so or it was without a doubt almost all of them would eventually like fess up and be like no Juan was I never you know took classes from him or I never because it it's a great marketing story you know and obviously their livelihood depends on this story and it has sold a lot of pots and it's awesome but the reality is no once people started opening up I saw there was a lot of pain because their grandfather was not acknowledged or their dad you know who worked with Juan to experiment and making these pots and who, you know, struggled right alongside, you know, Juan. And the thing is, I, I don't know who decided that it was just Juan. I don't know if Spencer arrived and Juan was like, yeah, it's a group of us that we do this. And Spencer was like, nah, you know, it's just you. Or, or if Juan was just like, it's just me. So I, I don't know why, I'll never know who, who decided that. But there's definitely a sentiment from a lot of the, the Ortiz family and um, to recognize like their father who's passed already, who, who was a friend of Juan and that he, he was known to make real, a lot of the effigies. Um, and a lot of people do want that, that story to come out that, you know, not to take away from Juan or any, anything, but you know, there were more players in the story. There's a more complex story than this romantic hero's journey. And the fact that they don't want to admit or, you know, Juan or, or Spencer didn't want, they didn't even want me to talk about looting. They didn't even like me using that word. Uh, but that's a reality. That's, that put food on the table for these community, you know, for this whole community at one point. And yeah, it's illegal. And as an archaeologist, it's horrifying to think about how much they destroyed you know, the archeological record, but at the end of the day, they were trying to put food on the table and they got really creative and real resourceful. So I think, you know, the, the complete story is so much more interesting to me and so much more complex. And I feel I'm not alone in that. I feel like a lot of the community members also want that to be known and wanna, you know, yeah, give credit to Juan, but there's more to the story than that. There, there is a chat thing here that says, um, I, I found this very interesting. Glad you brought the story to everyone. I cannot judge these men as their innate creativity is certainly evident. And she's from Nova Scotia, Canada. So um, I just want to say this was our first time trying this uh, both in person and online. We have a few glitches, as you can see. Um, 
but we will get it worked out before next time. And we really appreciate your, um, your patience with it all, both in person here and virtual. But I'm gonna hand it over to Paul, see if we have any more questions. Uh, any more questions, last minute questions? Well, I just want to reinforce something fab fabulous. I, said. And I spent 20 years in Chihuahua in the Casas Grandes digging looted sites, and it's frustrating. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but you gotta understand Mata Ortiz in the area had a nice, uh, the largest uh, sawmill in Latin America, and it went belly up. And then it became a railroad town, and it went belly up. And as Fabiola said, these people were dirt poor. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't like the looting as an archaeologist, and I've had to deal with it for two decades. But you can understand how, when they had to feed their family, they made these pots. And uh, the way to deal with it is to buy modern Matortis pots, okay? Because the, the tradition is absolutely incredible. The, uh, the creative energy going on in Matortis and the diversity. In fact, there's only one family really making sort of Ramos uh, style pottery. Everybody else is doing other stuff. So, uh, and if you have a chance to go down to visit, uh, Matortis is a very welcoming place. It's easy to get to now. They got a great road and Casas Grandes, Nueva Casas Grandes, Great museum, Pake Mayo, spectacular, good restaurants. So, and I don't get paid by the tourism board. So, but it's a it's a worth worth the trip down. And it's easy to get to, and it's it, and Matortiz, if you like pottery, is just an absolutely magical pace. Thank you, Fabiola. Appreciate it. Thank you.